Evin Poskia has a PhD in Earth Science from the University of Bergen. Um, he has been a guest teacher, a guest researcher at the Swiss uh, Federal Institute of, uh, Institute of Technology in Zürich, and also at the Institute of Studying Planet Earth, University of Arizona. He is currently, since 2016, a project leader and a senior advisor for the Bjergne Center of Climate Research, as well as a senior scientist with Uni Research Climate now, named Norse. Polsky is experienced in national and international research politics, building networks and investigating, instigating new project administration and collaborations across different scientific disciplines. Also, he is a co-writer of the book called What is Climate? And I thought uh, that was a good start of the day. What is climate? And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm from the Gürtner Center, or with the Gürtner Center for Climate Research. That's the one of the largest climate research centers in, in Europe. It's over 200 scientists affiliated to the center, which has existed since 2002. It's named after two pioneers within climate science called uh, William Bergnes and uh, his son, Jörg Bergnes. And uh, William Bergnes is usually considered the founding father of modern meteorology. Um, today I'm going to go through the climate system a little bit general, look at the wonders of the Earth system, and um, I'm going to give some examples. I'm going to look a little bit into the past, trying to understand the a bigger perspective or a bigger context for what's going on today. I'm also going to give some examples from some of the science that I've been involved in myself, which originates from the uh, what we call the cryosphere, so glaciers. And I'm going to end a little bit with talking about how uh, climate change can also impact society. The range of human impact on Earth and its climate are very close to being incomprehensible. It says comprehensible, which is uh, incomprehensible. And I think it represents an, a very big scientific challenge. I think sometimes when we talk about, for instance, cancer science or, or even space science, the money and resources we do, devote to those areas uh, are extremely large compared to you know, what we invest in climate science. And I'm not saying that because I'm just trying to put more money into the climate science community. I'm just saying that there is something about the size of the challenge doesn't really correspond to what we as a society invest in science. But it's also fun for climate scientists that there are big changes. And uh, it has raised uh, a lot of new interesting theories. It uh, compels scientists to work together across disciplines, which is very good. So, despite all these major changes, you know, Earth has a phenomenal ability to, to evolve, adapt, almost in an evolutionary way, I think. And it's also important to remember that the, the climate on Earth is a very much a co-production between, you know, what we receive from the sun and how we deal with that. Um, and so, basically, I just want to start to remind you that uh, the Earth is a, is a very interesting and wondrous system in the way it uh, redistributes energy. Sometimes easy to forget, maybe. So this is the average annual uh, top of atmosphere <coughs> net radiation. This is what we get from the sun. And you know, what you see here in the red is the excess around the equator. And in the blue, you see the outgoing long wave radiation. Mm. So there's obviously, I mean, if this was a stable system, then there will be very quickly a very large imbalance in the system. But this is what we get. And because the Earth spins, and because we have land, and we have ocean, and we have atmosphere, stuff happens to this uh, input that we get. And 
the earth sets everything into swing. So if you compare this again with the, the previous figure, you see the surface heat flux. The, that's what goes up from the ocean to the atmosphere. And keep in mind that there are large seasonal changes in this. So you know, we, the ocean, for instance, releases a lot of energy in the winter, and it takes up a lot of energy in the summer. You guys want to come here? You want to stand in the hallway the whole time? Yeah? Mm -hmm. There's a nice chair over there, okay. so you can just bring some more chairs if you want to. It's over there. Um, and there's, so there's a strong seasonality. But even so, you can see in red here uh, some of the large ocean currents in the world. For instance, uh, I don't know if I, I don't have a pointer here, but you can see outside the, the east coast of the US, you see the Gulf Stream, which we are known, which is some of the reasons why we have a very favorable conditions here in Norway, and you can see some of the major other uh, currents on Earth. So the Earth, you know, is tremendous in terms of redistributing uh, energy. And the ocean is slow, and the atmosphere is fast. And there are these gradients, so, you know, think about it like a pole to equator gradient. Every time in physics when you have a gradient, you, you get something into motion. Something starts to move. So, um, that's very important to keep in mind. And it's also important to keep in mind in terms of what happens now. So some of the surface waters that take up energy goes down into the depth of the ocean. And you know it can take several thousand years before that reemerge again at the surface. So, so there are long histories uh, in this ocean. Now, for instance, taking up carbon, some of that carbon will reemerge at some point. Some of the heat that we're now taking up will be reemerged at different times. And uh, we have done quite a lot of uh, advances in terms of understanding, for instance, the dynamics of the ocean, how it interacts with the atmosphere, and so forth. And perhaps I thought it would, was a good idea to show you a movie, uh, just to give you a sort of taste or a flavor for some of the complexity that surrounds the ocean uh, and the movement in it. And it's kind of hard to understand some of it, but it's also kind of beautiful. And I, you know, you're interested in art, so I'm going to show a lot of figures that. Uh, um, a lot of figures that uh, may seem a little bit complicated to you, but then again, you know, when you go to a museum, you look at something you don't understand, and at some point, you go, oh, now we get it, or maybe I don't. Maybe I just get inspired from it. So this is Greenland, obviously, Iceland down to the left there, and the light colors here are basically the currents, and this is uh, uh, courtesy of... Uh, a colleague at the University of Texas. This is an uh, ocean model that has been generated at the uh, MIT in Boston. So now you can see how the different currents move energy, move carbon uh, around in the system. And it's all kind of complicated. You see some of the systems are more stable than the others. And then you see sort of vortexes or or eddies that break loose from the from the major currents. I can show it once more. And of course, all of these things need to be taken into account when you're dealing with the, the global kind of system. And, and this is just one little slice of the whole system. It's just the ocean, actually. But all of those currents are important. And for instance, those currents coming down along the coast there of Greenland are also currently quite warm, so they melt, for instance, the type of the glaciers that go into the ocean from below, and then are part of destabilizing that system. So, you know, given the input on the energy we receive, I think it's quite amazing to what extent the Earth is able to accommodate that energy. And this is also evident from uh, a geological perspective. And a geological perspective is not just go up on a mountain and look at another mountain, but uh, in more of a deeper time sense. Uh, and some of this information comes from uh, ocean sediments. So the ocean is a tremendous library so because it's so stable. Anything that happens in the ocean, the sediments or life, will sort of fall down as snow on the bottom surface. And you will have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And so it's a very faithful recorder of anything that happens in the ocean. And some of these places in the ocean are so stable that these cores can go 
maybe a hundred million years back in time or more. So this is a, a, a plot showing the changes from to what we call Cenozoicum, or the last 65 million years. So time, this is an ongoing debate in the science community whether time along the axis go from left to right or from right to left. You can do a poll afterwards and see what you think. Uh, anyway, so 60 million years ago, you can see that there are, just by looking at the graph uh, in the lower panel here, you see temperature, uh, and you see that during this period of time, there are actually very large changes uh, on Earth. Um, you know, Earth has been much warmer than it is presently. Uh, and you see there are wiggles in those curves, suggesting that there are periods of time that are even warmer than the other. Hyperwarm periods, uh, for instance, around 55 million years. But you also see that there is a steady decline uh, from 60 or 55 million years and towards the present. And uh, that's a very interesting trend. So, you know, the Earth is here, the Sun is there, we have a system that operates this energy. You know, why, why would you have such a trend in the climate system? Anyone has a suggestion? I'm not going to do too much interactive uh, stuff on this point. Uh, <laughs> no? You're very shy? Do you think the sun has become weaker during the period of time? Or? No? So what we think here is that because you have mountain building and increased erosion, you're actually drawing down CO2 from the atmosphere. So during this period, there's a lot of stuff going on on Earth. Like the plate tectonics are shifting stuff around, you know, India crashes into Himalaya and so forth. And one of the curious effects of that is that you increase the drawdown of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. So during this period of time, Earth is actually getting cooler uh, on its own, right? Uh, the sun is there, the Earth is there, and so forth. And so during that period of time, you actually cross uh, thresholds, which also change uh, the climate on Earth in you know, at least what we would see in a, a human perspective, irreversible changes. So for instance, 35 million years ago, the climate on Earth is cool enough to uh, create glaciers and ice caps in Antarctica. And the positive feedback from that means that the ice sheets continue to grow. And ever since 35 million years ago, there has been ice sheets on Antarctica. And so that's a feedback mechanism, you know, adding on to the coolness that is uh, uh, contributed by the CO2. And then roughly 2.6 million years ago, we reached another <coughs> threshold. Um, and that threshold is that it's all of a sudden cool enough in the Northern Hemisphere for ice sheets to start to grow. Uh, and, uh, you know, we still have ice sheets. I mean, you saw the Greenland ice sheet uh, a slide ago. Um, so, and that's also something which has dominated the, the, the climate rhythm, so to speak, of Earth the last two uh, point six to five million years. The frequencies have changed and so forth. But it's interesting that these major changes also changes, you know, variability, seasonality changes, distribution of energy changes, and so forth. So one of the consequences of this is that, for instance, what happens when you start redistributing water from the ocean and onto land is that uh, sea levels start to change. Uh, and you can see that in the beginning of this period, uh, again, a little busy plot, but if you start in the upper panel, so that's the last 35 million years, and then there's the window on the right-hand side which is expanded in the middle panel and so forth down. And uh, Mir means a uh, million years ago. ET is before Crescent. And so you see that, you know, generally, if you just look at the, the, ma the max maximum and the mean, the total variation in sea level is 180 meters. That's quite a bit. That's on a global scale. And you see that it's very stable for a very long time. And then even with the Antarctic Crescent, it's a little bit higher. And then it starts to grow again around 5 million years ago, and you get the uh, 
ice sheets in the northern hemisphere, which is depicted in this figure to the left. You see Fennoscandian, Celtic, Barnes Sea, and you see a huge ice sheet over America. Everything is bigger in America, also the ice sheets. That's the Laurentide ice sheets. It totally dwarfs the Fennoscandian ice sheet. But anyway, uh, and so one of the consequences is that, you know, sea level is going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, just here. And Earth is accommodating that, right? And that's actually a rhythm that we have now broken. So that's uh, one for us and zero for the climate system. So the ocean apart, what other sources of information for changes on land uh, and in the atmosphere do we have? Uh, and uh, I could probably speak for hours on this. I won't. I can't. Uh, so I'm just going to choose one of those archives, uh, which also is extremely interesting and rewarding archive for, for, for climate change, and it's ice cores. And so, you know, thankfully we have this big ice sheet on Antarctica. Uh, and that's in, in much in the same sense, but also very differently from the sediments that are raining down on the bottom of the seafloor. Uh, the ice sheet also uh, uh, records changes. And it does so uh, because it snows every year. So the snow gradually, one layer of snow on top of another layer of snow, and then when that gets compacted, it deforms, get the closure, and it becomes ice. So in Antarctica, this zone can be almost 100 meters. On Greenland, a little bit shorter. And in that ice, you know, you get uh, not proxies of change, but you can actually get direct measurements of what it was once uh, back in time. So because when the snow and the ice is sealed off, you get air bubbles within the ice. And in those tiny air bubbles, there is a, a little sample of the atmosphere when it was closed. Which means that, you know, we have this fantastic, amazing, totally amazing record of uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, CH4, and so forth. So we can actually look into, you know, quite a bit of detail on how climate has changed in this period. And uh, this is a very busy plot, so you have to forgive me, but you, you, again, we move from left to right. Age this time, this is 800,000 years ago. And this is almost a, a, a four kilometer long core. So the whole core, this is one of the huge endeavors in the climate science community, has been drilled out from Antarctica. And every little tiny part of that ice core has been sampled and measured. And then, of course, as you saw in the previous slide, we now have ice cores from quite a few places in uh, Antarctica, for different reasons. Uh, but you have quite a few records, so you can replicate some of those findings that you have. And so, perhaps the most interesting curves, the two lowermost, or the two curves above the black one here, are CO2 and, and methane. And you can see that, you keep in mind now that we have these ice ages that come and go, you have the sea level that fluctuates, and it also turns out that, you know, CO2 plays a very prominent role in explaining uh, how the ice ages come and go. It's not the only uh, explanation. The, the, the major uh, explanation is how the Earth uh, is configured and orbits around the Sun. That's uh, another story. I just wanted to show you this because this is actually direct measurements of the atmosphere uh, once upon a time, going 800,000 years back in time. And you see the tops is what we call interglacials. It's warm periods. We're currently in an interglacial. Some would call it Anthropocene by now. It's an interglacial, so that's the high level. And then you drop down into the ice ages, and you see that the CO2 drops as well. Pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, variability defines our climate history, so what's new then? And of course, the new one is this one of the most important figures I think we have. And it shows the atmospheric concentration of CO2. This is a record that was started by Charles Keeling in 1957 uh, on Hawaii. So it was very isolated from industry and so forth, which was the idea to get pristine measurements of CO2 from the atmosphere. 
And there's a little anecdote there is that people didn't really believe healing when they wanted to start measuring CO2 in the atmosphere because everyone thought that you know CO2 in the atmosphere will be buffered by the ocean. So the ocean, you you, you put CO2 into the atmosphere, the ocean will take it. So there won't be any change. So why on earth should we put money into this uh, uh, instrument and, and put resources into this? And so you know he braved on and. Uh, and he got some funding. He lost actually funding in uh, two years or something. But after that, around 1960, there's been continuous measurements. And this is a very scary graph too. So you know, when we started back in '57 with this, the knowledge about how the carbon system operated was, you know, uh, it wasn't zero, but the human impact on it uh, was very low. So you know, basically, it's just like with the whales. You know, Norwegian and the whales. We, we basically just fished whales until there wasn't any fish left. I mean, not fish, but uh, whale. Just in 1875, there were 285,000 blue whales, for instance, in the ocean. In 1966, when we got the ban, there was something between 600,000 individuals left. And the whole idea there is that you know we just thought it was you know we just thought that we could kill whales forever, you know, and that the uh, ocean would just uh, replenish that. And the same was basic in some sense with the CO2. But, it, you know, obviously that uh, has changed. And, and you know, it, perhaps that figure looks a little bit innocent. Uh, but if we plot it compared to the last 800,000 years, which is this uh, orange dot up there, you see that we're, we're totally diverging uh, from the rhythm uh, that has dominated Earth uh, uh, during the last 2.6 for a million years, and we're doing it at an incredible rate of change. And of course, we started to talk. We talked about you know how the ocean is actually taking up that energy. And in the lower panel, you see the black curve. Uh, that's actually the ocean taking up all that energy, a lot of that energy that we put into the atmosphere. And you know we could do the similar with the carbon system. And the question is, of course. Uh, Will that rate of uptake continue into the future? And that's going to have a huge impact on many things. We don't really know that. So, um, that's the climate system. And of course, there's another thing. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but the Earth has, of course, been totally transformed. It's surface by humans. So the whole colonization effect has also changed the way uh, Earth operates. Uh, huge concentration in, in cities. Uh, you know, when humans started colonizing Earth, maybe 50% of the land surface was forest. Now, 25% maybe is land forest, uh, and so forth. There's huge changes to the to the Earth surface. So there's also, you know, changes to that. Uh, where do we see large irreversible? Maybe not irreversible, I'm not too fond of that word, but certainly on a human time scale it's irreversible. Changes on Earth, uh, things we can see for ourselves. Um, I don't have to be an expert. Um, you can think of it like climate change visibility. You know, some things is, you know, uh, we, we're still suckers for seeing is believing. Uh, and, uh, and so on the one hand, we have what's visible, right, of change, and on the other hand, we have the invisible stuff. Uh, and the invisible stuff would be things like ocean acidification, we can't really see that. Or, you know, that the ocean is doing us a great favor by taking up all this excess heat. But we can see stuff that goes on with vegetation, for instance, you know, dams and structures and so forth. And if there ever was a canary in the coal mine, in the climate system, then I think it's glaciers. And Glaciers are very visible uh, examples of how the uh, Earth is changing. Uh, this is a uh, glacier in Upper Engadin in Switzerland. It's, uh, you see the lobe coming out from the mountain here. Uh, this is in 1914, and I was there just last uh, weekend. And, uh, Almost there's this glacier has almost been half the last uh, century, and and uh, I think you know twenty maybe thirty years from now, many of these glaciers will be you know completely absent. Uh, the same is true for some of the glaciers in Norway, 
And uh, almost 10 years ago, we went on a little expedition to an island in the southern Arctic fringe called the uh, uh, South Georgia, where whalers once were. Uh, it's within that uh, red ring there. And we went down to, you know, look at how the glaciers in the southern hemisphere interact with climate change. Uh, and so we went to this <coughs> part of the island, which is uh, ice free. This is for those of you who are interested in polar history, <coughs> also the area where Shackleton crossed. Um, and uh, we went to look at the glacier that the British Antarctic Survey had been uh, monitoring in uh, the beginning of the 50s and up to the Falkland War in 1982. So we knew that there was a glacier down there. This is a third glacier, it's a small alpine glacier. And we also knew that it had been you know, receding since 1955 and at least up to 1982, and we had some satellite images from 1998, you know, showing the glacier. And you know, you crossed, go around the world to look at this glacier, and when we came up there, it was just melted away. So at first, that was a big disappointment, of course, and then you know, it's very interesting. Has this happened before? You know, uh, what are the boundary conditions for this? And we started looking at some of the other glaciers too. So this is a small glacier. There are also large glaciers on on South Georgia. This is the Neumeyer Glacier, uh, and you see those small icebergs uh, at the end of that blue arrow. Uh, and you see that the glacier has also retreated quite a lot during that period of time. So that's, um, yeah. So going down there, we see that you know this glacier is just retreating incredibly fast uh, uh, from a position where it was actually in 1973. Uh, and when we compile some of these data, we, you know, we show clearly that you know, the, the glaciers on South Georgia are uh, retreating at an extremely fast rate. And that summer temperature, which is the figure on the left there, uh, shows that the it's becoming quite a lot of warmer in the summer. And, uh, if you dr if you reduce or you know the winter precipitation and increase the summer temperature, then that's a killer combination for a glacier. And basically, they're just uh, disappearing into thin air. And now we also have. Uh, looked at the variability of Hodges Glacier, the one we saw previous. Uh, and so it has been quite a bit larger than during the 50s and 80s. Uh, but it has actually been present since the last 14,000 years. Um, and uh, now it's gone. So we can go back again to the Northern Hemisphere and to the Arctic. The Arctic is playing a very prominent role in the whole narrative of climate change, especially in the northern hemisphere. And uh, just before I show some variations of the sea ice, I just want to remind you that there's, in many ways, there's been a revolution in, in data uh, availability for people who work in this field. And in the 1970s, we had a very little data on the sea ice of the Arctic. There was some data, it was classified. Uh, some of it was uh, collected by <coughs> submarines and so forth, uh, very little. And there was also a very little understanding of, um, of, uh, of you know, how it actually paired up with climate, and also its sensitivity to climate change. And today, with the venture of satellites, which in effect started operating in 1979, we have a, a lot of data which you know, allow you to, to do some kind of precise measurements. So that has changed uh, quite a bit. And uh, if you want to look into the future, uh, you need to take into account how much CO2 we will continue to emit or not emit. Uh, and that's usually uh, in the IPCC lingo. Uh, we talk about representative concentrations pathway. Uh, uh, and that depends on, you know, how, basically how much CO2 we're going to release into the atmosphere. Because we don't know that, you know, we don't know the exact number of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere in 2017 or 2070 or 2090. So, you know, you do estimates and, and uh, 
And so you have to include those in, in all climate sort of model scenarios of the future takes this into account. And it's usually represented by an RCP, uh, for instance, of 8.5, which is the most radical version of that uh, scenario thinking. At least that's what we think now. Uh, and it means basically that there's 8.5 more watts per square meter relative to what the situation was in 1750. And then you can go into the model world, which has become a very big part of the climate uh, science community. Uh, and this is a model that's been run for many times, and it pairs different sources of data. So it's not just uh, model data, it's also historical observations, um, it's uh, modern observations, uh, and then you run the model. So this one goes from uh, roughly 1930 and up to <coughs> 2100. And what you're seeing here is the sea ice uh, extent uh, in uh, winter time, uh, not summer time. And you see this uh, gradual movement, this slope going from you know steady, sort of a steady system, and then the slope downwards, and then a new steady system. Uh, and so one of the big questions is, when exactly is that going to happen? Because, of course, when sea ice, with such a large change in the sea ice cover, you change the uh, ocean atmosphere energy exchange, you make it available for uh, oil and gas, uh, for shipping, and so forth. So this is you know, a, a key question. But it's also very difficult. So what you immediately see, or maybe you don't, but the red dot in that figure, that's roughly now, so you see that, you know, despite this, is a very sophisticated model. And it's clearly way too conservative for, so for what goes on. So if you just add on to the historical observations, uh, you see that, you know, that uh, the model starts drifting off from the actual observations. And then you can do some, you can add some other models and, uh, and uh, you can also do different uh, approaches, extrapolation, and so forth. But you see that at the end, all of these models suggest that, you know, by 2080 or, or 2100, uh, the CS cover uh, will be very small, probably less than 10%. That's the definition of an open uh, Arctic. And so, you know, for decision makers, this is an interesting dilemma, right? Because uh, the people who are experts on this, uh, Ingrid and Marius Orton, which did this study, you know, it's very hard to to say, you know, exactly when is this going to happen. Is it uh, 20, 23, 22, 23, that's wrong, but anyway, 2036, is it 2061 to 2088, is it 2028, is it 2061, you know, but clearly uh, something has happened, and some would probably argue that you, you know, you have, you know enough uh, to start acting. But it's also hard to act because you're not going to, uh, that system isn't going to go back again to what it once was. I don't think so anyway. Uh, and so the whole understanding of, you know, how you preserve something which is going to evolve uh, and become something different uh, yeah, is it, complicated. Um, and also, you know, this area, it's interesting, I was mentioning this, it's uh, you know, it's the area of uh, oil and gas interests in Norway. Uh, and interestingly, too, I mean, the changes in, in temperature and also management means that the cold, for instance, is now overwintering in the Arctic. So it's also changing large parts of the ecosystem uh, and so forth. So, you know, how does climate and science connect with society? Perhaps someone is better suited to answer that question than me. But I do know that um, uh, for for us, you know, serving society, what does it mean? Uh, traditionally, you know, we carry out state-of-the-art science. That's what we do. Uh, we educate the few, and we hope to enlighten the many. That's the ratio in the room right now. No? Too subtle, that joke. Okay. Um, so, but at the same time, you know, there's this growing recognition that climate change is the sort of very fabric of society. And to a large extent, I think also climate scientists are beginning to ask, you know, <coughs> what do scientific findings mean in, in human terms? And, you know, I would 
it's interesting to look at you know how much impact from change actually can have on society. So I think this is a very interesting figure. Uh, it's from Burke et al. And if you move from uh, your right and to where it's left, you know, and you see that there is a question of scale, right? So there's the global tropics, it's sub-Saharan Africa, it's East Africa, it's a Tanzanian village, right? And on the lower panel, that's the corresponding change. So you, you can see that there's changes in the, uh, for instance, the ocean temperature anomalies connected with the ANSO system, the largest and most important climate system on Earth. Uh, and you see that there is a correlation with the uh, you know, civil conflict onset. And if you move on to the left, you see there's a, there's a correlation with civil war incidents. And you continue down into <coughs> one area, and you see there's local violence that can be spurred by temperature change. And to the left, you see witch murder, which is kind of, that's almost bizarre. I'm not saying that there's a single causal causality between these things, but I think to many, I, I don't think, I think we're just at the brink of starting to understand how climate change is, uh, can affect societies on very many levels. And uh, economic modeling has also started uh, to look more into how climate change uh, might impact uh, economies and societies. And I kind of like this uh, crazy figure. So in the middle it's 2010, and there's two different types of scenarios. The gray one, which says that climate isn't really changing at all, uh, no need to worry. And then the red one takes into account climate change again with the RCP 8.5 scenario. And in the gray, you basically see a very prosperous future. You see each of these lines then represent one country, right? And you can see that some of those lines, you know, during the time from 2010 to 21, is, you know, they're crossing, they're advancing, and the, and the gross national product is increasing. But if you look at the red one, you can also see that, you know, for still some time, you know, the world will be a very prosperous place and economies will grow. And then around maybe 2040 or 2050, you see that uh, a lot of those lines start to drop because they're not adapted to uh, the climate change that they're experiencing. And so it will undermine the economy. And even some of the rich countries, so Norway will probably be one of those, you know, upper red lines here. But you see some of the rich countries like you know, in part US, for instance, will start to decline in terms of the economy if they're impacted by climate change. And so what you're basically seeing here is a symmetry. And you're seeing that the inequality in Earth is going to be amplified by climate change. Uh, there is a lot to be said about the science behind this. I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to dwell on that. But I think it's, a, you know, it's an interesting perspective on, on climate change. And... Uh, and basically, I, I think I'm, I'm coming to an end here now. Uh, what kind of future we will have uh, is very much going to depend, actually, on how much CO2 we're going to emit. That's going to have profound consequences for the climate system. And the range here, you see, is the different scenarios. So, you know, and, and, and now, just now, we're, we're, last year we passed a climate law in Norway and we're saying that we're supposed to uh, reduce uh, emissions with 40% uh, within uh, 2030. Uh, and S Sweden and Denmark and Germany has already you know, reduced their emissions <coughs> by around 25%. And, and Norway hasn't changed its emissions compared to 1990 with more than maybe 1 or 2%. So, you know, you need to do some cuts. And, and that all depends on, you know, where we're going to end up on that scale. Uh, and the other thing which varies quite a few uh, people is that if you remember one of those first graphs I showed you where you see the inception of the uh, ice sheets on Antarctica, and you see these almost irreversible changes in the system. Uh, already now we know that um, the uh, period of ice age rhythm, which has, you know, marked Earth for 2.65 million years, is broken. We're not going to have uh, another ice age for at least half a million years. 
And that's because, you know, when, once you release the carbon into the system, it has a tendency to stay in the system, so you don't get rid of it all that fast. Uh, and so the question is, are we closing in on, on this planetary threshold? Where we're moving into what some scientists have called the, the hot house. Um, and uh, I mean, that remains to be seen. Uh, but it's also what we uh, do with it. And uh, the question then is, do, do Earth cope with climate change? It certainly does. I mean, the Earth is amazing. That's my question. Right? I think the Earth is amazing at, at accommodating uh, that change. Uh, the question is if it can still serve human beings the way it has served human beings before. Uh, and I think that's going to be my last remark. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.